test, which is currently going on now. And in order to talk about this, we have Andrew Roof. Uh, he told me to make up something about him, but uh, you know, I, he's a very nice person, which I don't think is made up. <laughs> Unless it is. No, just All right, let's thank our speaker. All right, good morning, thank you for coming here. Um, our work describes a contest that we've been running for the past two years, and an iteration of it is currently ongoing, as Adam said, thank you. Um, so it's too late to sign up, but look for it in the future. Um, called Build It, Break It, Fix It. And this talk will describe the contest and its structure and why we did it and the data that we gather from it overall. So why contests? Well, one reason is contests are cool. We incentivize a bunch of smart hackers to come out and show off what they're good at, and they like to do that and it's interesting to study from them. But another interesting thing is, what if we created like a contest where its structures and incentives mirrored the real world? And then is there something that we could learn about the real world from observing what happens inside of this sort of terrarium of our contest? So when we think about this, we're like, okay, what contests exist presently? How do they work and do they do this and do they have these properties and is there anything we can sort of borrow from them? Well, there are existing security focused contests like uh, DEF CON Capture the Flag and the National Cyber Collegiate Defense Competition. And those are mostly focused on either sort of offensive security or defensive security respectively, or either hacking into someone else's stuff or stopping someone from hacking into your stuff or sometimes doing both at the same time. But in neither of those competitions are you sort of building something from the ground up. And there are also competitions where you do build stuff from the ground up like Top Coder, but they don't really have the security or adversarial focus. So what if we made a contest that had both of these uh, as sort of key uh, foundational elements where contestants both create software and hack other people's software and then we try to see you know what sort of emerges from this and uh, hopefully the contestants also have a good time while they're doing it. So we want to create something and we want to have some principles uh, when we create it. So we want something that we can get data from that has, mean that is, has meaning. Uh, we want the contest structure to scale. We want to be able to run it. We're two or three researchers at a university, uh, so the two or three of us should be able to run it and put it on um, and get hundreds of hundreds to ideally thousands of participants through it. Um, and we also want participants to have a good time. Uh, so this is for a few different reasons. I mean, one, I don't want to sort of go to sleep every night thinking, oh yeah, you know, a few thousand people had a really terrible time on the internet because I forced them to do something. Like, that just doesn't sound good. But also because it's very difficult to incentivize and motivate people to do something when the thing you want them to do is no fun at all. Um, it, this should sound familiar if you ever had a job that is terrible. Um, yeah. So, the also ideal is that, um, so what would this contest look like? Um, oopsies. So, the contest structure that we propose mirrors the name of the contest, Build It, Break It, Fix It. So we divide a contest into three sort of distinct logical stages. So then the Build It phase, uh, we have about a two week period where contestants are given a specification that we create to cre uh, write some piece of software, like a secure log file system or a secure communication system where the setting is a bank and an ATM. And the contestants are free to use any programming language that they want as long as their solution compiles on a Linux virtual machine that we distribute and sort of update over the contest. Then the second phase is this break it phase where, and this is where things get a little different, we take all of the implementations that passed a basic set of correctness tests from the build it phase and distribute them to all contestants in the break it phase. And we tell them, hey, if you can find bugs in any of these things, you get points. The people that wrote the software lose points. And then finally, we have this fix it phase where the contestants that built software and had it broken during the break it phase are given fixes and then they, uh, bugs that were reported during the break it phase and then fix them. So at the end of this, we wind up with sort of two overall scores, one for the best builder and one for the best breaker. So, you know, there are elements of the different types of contests that I talked about before that are present in each of these distinct phases. So build it is sort of like top coder, um, but there's a security part of the specification where there isn't in like a top coder contest. The break it is sort of like a capture the flag exercise, except instead of the programs that you're trying to hack uh, being these synthetic exercises that are put together as sort of uh, puzzles by the contest organizer, um, they're naturally arising uh, problems that other developers like you created during the contest. So 
if we want con uh, contests to do this um, and sort of have this structure and flow and mirror the real world, um, we need the contestants to participate and play along. We can't just sort of sit down and say, hey, we want you to do exactly this. They're not going to have fun doing that. They're probably not going to listen to you at all. So we need to set up a series of incentive structures that motivate the contestants to sort of do the things that we want them to do and create the data that we want to observe. So what does that look like? Well, we want builders to create software that is featureful and performant, because that's what the real world asks people to do. When someone comes to you and they say, hey, I want this communications protocol to do this thing, it needs to have features and it needs to work well to succeed in the marketplace. But we also want people to make these things with an eye to security, and we want these two things to have tension. Uh, so people should be motivated to do one thing than the other, because that's sort of what the marketplace does as well. Okay. So during the break it phase, we also want to motivate breakers um, because the, in this contest, the way that we get data about what implementations are secure and what implementation, implementations are not secure, our sort of notion of ground truth, comes from the breakers themselves. So we want breakers to focus their attention on all of the different implementations that are created. We don't want to corral people towards looking at the one or two very, very bad implementations. Um, and we also want to prefer people to find bugs that are violations of some security property and not some sort of low-level uh, correctness property. So how does the scoring system work? Well, we have a few different notions of score, like I mentioned before. Uh, so first we have this idea of a ship score, which is your score after you have completed the build it round. So builders gain points for correctness and performance of their implementations. Uh, so the correctness is simply a, a flat point value that's a parameter of how many contestants are in the contest. And then performance is sort of how well you're doing compared to the best and the current best and worst implementations in the contest. So then during the break it phase, um, breakers gain points for every bug that they find. So, well, more specifically, they gain points for every unique bug that they find. And then during the fix-it phase, it's figured out which bugs are found by a breaker. Um, so if there are three teams and they all report three different, bu uh, three different bugs in one implementation, during the fix-it phase, those bugs are all unified into one bug where the, fixer, where the fixer says, hey, you know, there are these three different bug reports. They're all fixed by doing the same thing to the software. I'm going to call that one bug. So then the breakers share the point value for this sort of now morally one bug. So we also limit the breakers to report sort of five bugs per build it submission. And this is part of the incentive structure that I mentioned before, where we try to get the breakers to look at all of the different pieces of software created during the build it phase and not just focus their attention on the one or two things they think are going to be particularly fruitful. And we also uh, corral the breakers to try to find security bugs by awarding them more points for finding security bugs than for finding crash bugs and awarding them more points for finding crash bugs than correctness bugs. So at the end, uh, sort of after the fix-it phase, this is sort of where the zero-sum game of the contest emerges. So builder scores are still the sum of their correctness and performance, but minus the bugs that are found during the break-it phase. So this also sort of mirrors what you think happens to software, what you would like to think happens to software in the real world, where someone says, ah, this thing has been created, and you know, it's wonderful and featureful. There's this instant messaging application. I can talk to all of my friends. But oh no, all of these bugs have been found in it, and now I don't have any confidence or trust in it. What am I to do? And then you, you look sort of at the end state of the marketplace in terms of what things have good features that I like, but are also sort of withstood adversarial attention. And where this really becomes obvious uh, is when we look at some data from a run of the contest and how the builder scores change over time. So in this figure, uh, the x-axis is date or time uh, over the course of the entire contest. And then the y-axis is the build it team score, um, which goes from a value below zero up to about 2000. So we're going to have about 11 teams go through this contest and they're going to implement their solutions in a variety of different programming languages. And then this represents their progress during the build it score, build it phase. So this sort of mirrors what you would expect from you know, the software development process and initial release of some product. You have lots of implementations that are sort of near the top because they've all figured out basically the same out, uh, the best case algorithm for the problem that we asked them to solve. There are some people that did not and somehow managed to turn something that should be linear into quadratic. This is what happens when you ask people on the internet to do something. Um, and some people sort of change positions back and forth uh, based off of minor tweaks they make to their algorithms. So, okay, that's cool. 
During the break-it phase, uh, this also sort of mirrors what you would expect to happen in the real world. Adversarial attention is focused on software, and some pieces of software fare better at this than others. Some fall a little bit, some fall quite a lot. Um, and then finally, during the fix-it phase, you can see different contestants say, ah, I've received all of these bugs. Um, some of them are duplicate. I'm going to co uh, collapse them all into one bug report. I'm going to gain some points back by reporting that. And then we wind up sort of with this final state of the implementations, modulo, finding bugs in them, and some of where those are security bugs. So now that I've like described the contest and sort of described what we set out to do, let's sort of look at the um, results. So it doesn't make much sense to talk about the results without talking about the specifications of the problems that we asked uh, build it contestants to solve. So the first one that we asked people to solve sort of in earnest is a problem that's described as a secure log. So in the secure log uh, setting, we ask contestants to create a pair of applications that manage the state of a log file system. So the first program is this log append program, and you invoke it with a series of command line parameters that describe in our setting the movement of employees and visitors in an imaginary art gallery. So you, know, you say, all right, I want someone to enter the art gallery at time 8 a.m., and their name is Bob. I want someone named Alice to enter at 8.01, and they enter the office and not the gallery. Um, and then at 8.15, Alice leaves the office. So then the second program that we ask people to write is a program called log read, uh, which queries the log uh, with a series of sort of canned parameters. So well, can query parameters. So the dash r query asks, hey, uh, what rooms has Alice been in at any point in time during their interaction in the gallery? And this query would return, ah, Alice has been in the office. So you can imagine this is sort of useful in a forensic setting where you would say, well, okay, I want a sort of immutable attestation of where different employees and guests have been so that if there's been a theft, I can try to figure out who was responsible. So in this setting, uh, we identify explicitly that the adversary has rewrite access to the log. Uh, however, the adversary does not know anything in the setting uh, immediately about the key. So the key is supplied on the command line, um, it's not given directly to the adversary, so the builders can rely on that when they're creating their security parameter. And this sort of, we don't explicitly call for it, but if you think about this for a little bit, you realize, okay, I need some kind of uh, authenticated encryption on this file, and then if I want to have a good performance score, I can try to figure out a way to chain it together without requiring me to look at the entire file when I do an append, okay? So this was interesting, and we have data about this implementation. Uh, series of implementations that were made. And then later, we asked them to create a, another series of a pair of applications which implement secure communications over a network channel. So our setting for this was a bank, or an imaginary bank and an imaginary ATM. So the first program is a bank, which starts a server that listens on a TCP port, and it has an authorization file that describes who the bank is. We say there should be a, we, we describe in a specification as a file that, author, that defines what the bank is. We don't give them any, uh, mandate about what should be in the file or what the structure of the network communication should be. This is all a design space that's left open to the contestants. And then the second program that we have them create is an ATM program. Um, and the operation of the ATM program is specified via command line. And the first option operation that it can carry out is the creation of an account. So you say, all right, I want there to be an account for an individual named Bob with an initial balance of $1,000. And we say Bob is identified by a card file. The structure of the card file is also left completely uh, up to the contestants. So someone says, all right, I'm going to put some cryptographically authenticating data in both auth and card, and then that's how this is all going to work. So then we, can, we provide the specification for this command line, um, these command line parameters. So someone says, all right, I want to deposit $50 into Bob's account. The bank's balance on the server side updates, and then I want to withdraw $600, and Bob's balance on the server side updates as well. So we can test both of these automatically pretty well. And in this setting, um, the security model is that the adversary has read-write access to this channel between the bank and the ATM. So this is also pretty sensible. So you would say, ah, you need some kind of authenticated encryption, like perhaps TLS between the ATM and the bank using a key stored in auth. Or maybe you would try to come up with something like many of our contestants did that's slightly more creative, trying to eke out performance points at the risk of uh, creating something that isn't a totally secure construction like many of our contestants. The uh, man in the middle where the adversary also potentially has access to a few of the card files for a few of the accounts, sort of increasing the uh, interesting properties of what could go wrong. So, okay, 
what did the results look like for asking people to do these and how many people did we get to participate? Well, in the spring, uh, we had 68 teams um, with about 156 participants that sat down and tried to implement the secure log file. And in the fall, we had 48 teams with 112 participants. Now, for our participant pool, we sort of dually advertised uh, on the internet and via a massive open online course hosted on Coursera. So this contest for Coursera was a capstone exercise for a cybersecurity degree specialization project. So we got a bunch of contestants that had a range of different experience, uh, life, sort of life experiences. Many of the contestants had you know, about 10 years of software development experience and they had just taken classes on like security and cryptography and software security and usable security. So this is a sort of interesting contestant cohort. Now, we left it open as to what programming language they would use, so what programming languages did they decide to use? Uh, well, there are some sort of usual, usual, uh, usual suspects on this graph. The x-axis are the different programming languages, and you can see they sort of span the gamut from what you would expect, like Java and Python and Go, to the slightly more esoteric, like Scala and F-sharp, and then the sort of bizarre, like PHP. Some people decided, hey, today I'm going to sit down and write a pair of command line applications in PHP. Why not? I can think of many reasons why not, but hey, it sort of worked for them. Um, some languages are far more popular than others, like Python and Go, which was sort of interesting. Um, so when we did our data analysis in a model, um, we grouped these languages together based off of their type system. So there are some languages that have a static type system, some languages that have a dynamic type system, and then C and C++ are just sort of so special that we put them in their own category. So with that, um, how do we analyze the score? So we identified a set of factors and use linear and logistic regression to identify correlations between those factors and a team's score. Uh, we also use the logistic re regression to correlate uh, features of an application with whether or not um, a security bug was present simply as a Boolean value. So we looked at two different types of score. Um, we looked at a ship score, so this is sort of the pre-break phase uh, quality of an implementation, and we looked at the breaker score, so how many points or how many bugs did you find and how many points did you get for the bugs that you found. So as inputs to our model, we used a bunch of different things, that, uh, piece, data points that we gathered about the contestants from the competition. Some of these are self-reported and some of these are measured. So the three at the top are the self-reported and the rest at the bottom are things that we measured. So we surveyed our contestants and we asked them, hey, how well do you think you know C? Uh, how many programming languages do you think you know? Um, and what's your coding experience like? And though this could be subject to some sort of self-reporting bias, um, we believe that it sort of washes out in the noise um, of the data. So now let's sort of look at um, what our model indicated from the ship score. So in this graph, the x-axis represents the lines of code in a particular implementation, while the y-axis is the ship score, or the score that an implementation holds at the end of the build it round. The dots are in the three categories of language. Dynamic is a red triangle, uh, static is a green square, and C and C++ are blue dots. So this is sort of interesting because you can see there's like a cluster of little blue dots that are up in the upper left. And this means that uh, C language, uh, stuff written in C had a pretty high ship score, which you would expect intuitively uh, from saying, oh, well, C is a very efficient language. You're not leaving much on the table with the runtime. So that's pretty good. Uh, and then, but it's slightly more verbose than some of the very terse scripting languages, which are the red triangles that you see up in the far upper left where you can say, okay, I can fit a lot less code that does about the same thing, um, but they have varying different sort of performance qualities, which you can see by some of the red triangles being further down on the ship score than other red triangles and the blue dots. So this is a little uh, weird because this is like a projection of some like uh, two-dimensional data from a higher dimensional data is because we were looking at a bunch of different factors in our model. Um, so this is the uh, table that the model produced. Um, so this table looks at how likely an implementation was to have sort of at least one security bug. So the first column shows the factors in the analysis that, uh, that were determined to be most significant. Now the odds ratio indicates how likely you were to wind up in one category or the other. Um, and the statistically, uh, so in the statically typed case, um, so what this, this chart is overall telling you is that in our analysis, the uh, usage of C, uh, a language being C was the base case. So we can take this odds ratio um, and put it under one and wind up uh, discovering that the model is telling that you are about eight times more likely to have a security bug present inside of your implementation if you use C than if you don't, which sort of makes sense if you think about C's history and legacy. So, you can also look at this graphically. 
And you can say, well, okay, so on this graph, um, the x-axis represents different language categories um, separated out into C, dynamic, and static. And then the y-axis is the percentage of implementations in that language category in which a security bug was found. And then these are broken down into two different uh, contest periods. So the blue one is the spring, and then the red one is the fall. So in this graph, you can see, ah, well, there are far more C and C++ implementations that had some kind of security bug. Um, and then that trend sort of seems to be uh, negatively correlated with whether or not you use C or dynamic or static. Now, it's important to note that uh, this is somewhat relevant to whether or not you used uh, a memory safe language or not. We can make C do a little better if we take the security bugs that were reported and we remove the bugs that were related to memory safety, which is cheating from a security practitioner's perspective, but we did it anyway. Um, and when you do that, the, this lo sort of loses its statistically, uh, statistical significance and sort of one is no better than the other, which is kind of interesting. So we can move away from looking at like the qualitative data, um, well the quantitative data, and start talking about the qualitative data. So like we have all these bugs and all these different implementations. What did those bugs look like? Well, one uh, sort of common problem uh, is when people set out to create this authenticated encrypted log file, they didn't correctly compose the cryptographic primitives together. So they said, ah, I need to use authenticated encryption. I need to have a series of records. Each record will be independently uh, encrypted and HMACed. But I don't need to do anything about the overall file. And this is sort of false. So imagine you have our log set up as before. Um, you do a query to ask where Alice is. Alice is in the office. But then the attacker comes in and they say, well, OK, I can manipulate the order of or presence of entries inside of this log file without corrupting any sort of authenticating information about it. So I'm going to remove the last two entries from the log file and leave only Bob's record there. And now when this query runs, Alice was simply never there, and the message is still authenticated. So this is kind of interesting because like, a contestant looked at this problem specification and they looked at their bag of um, implementation primitives and they were like, okay, I need to use something from here. They didn't choose exactly the right ones. In the secure communications example, almost uh, this problem, almost no team correctly uh, implemented a replay resistant protocol. So how this showed up is um, someone's bank would listen for communications to an ATM. Um, we allowed breakers to come in with a man in the middle program that would listen to traffic. Um, someone would do a withdrawal of $500. The man in the middle would simply record that message verbatim and then replay it later. And then this would result in Bob's balance instead of going from 1,000 to 500, going from 1,000 to zero. So this shouldn't happen. Oh well. Um, now, we also analyzed um, sort of quanti uh, quantitatively the breaker scores. Uh, and here we used a similar set of variables in our analysis. Uh, we added a few. So the one that we added um, was we added, uh, in terms of a self-reported thing, we asked breakers, you know, did you use any advanced techniques like fuzzing or some kind of static analysis to find bugs? We also uh, measured whether or not they participated in the build it round. So the punchlines from this analysis are that Breakers self-reporting whether or not they used advanced techniques really didn't have any impact on their break it score. And we hypothesize that this is because the types of bugs that were found, like these reordering of records or replay resistance, can't really be found via fuzzing or um, off-the-shelf bug finding tools. We also discovered that sort of somewhat unsurprisingly, having more team members correlated with having a higher break it score. However, having more team members during the build it score did not correlate to a high, build it phase did not have a higher, correlate to a higher build it score. We have, this is, sort of makes sense. Uh, having um, more team, this activity is more easily parallelizable. We also looked at, or we tried to measure um, how resilient an imp uh, implementation was. So we would say, okay, we tried to have a, a mechanism of record recording of sort of how far did your build it score fall as a result of the break it phase. So our ship score is characterized by the circle in the upper left. And then the resilience score was how far it fell down into the lower right. However, this didn't really work out because um, it turned out that lots of contestants looked at their final score and said, ah, there were just too many bugs found. I'm not going to fix anything. So the data doesn't really mean too much, which is a somewhat fa a slight failure of the incentive system. So you can see that from this uh, chart that we made where the uh, x-axis represents the teams, the y-axis represents this resilience score that we computed, and then the dots are circular if the contestant participated at all in the fix and phase and triangular if they did not, and you can see having a worse resilience score is basically directly correlated with simply whether or not they participated and fix it. 
So we wound up not being able to use that in our analysis or draw any conclusions from it. So in the future, we hope to address some of these problems in the incentive structure um, and also test out different uh, problem design spaces. So we created a problem based around authorization logic where we have people create a interpreter for a programming language where you have access control on different variables. Um, we also tried to, in the most recent contest, tried to motivate increased participation in Fixit by saying, hey, you know, there, it isn't just a top two, uh, there's a possibility for a lottery and decreasing brackets over the overall score, uh, scoring phase. Um, and in the future, maybe we'll investigate sort of different incentive methods, uh, methodologies for prize distribution. Um, we also could conduct additional follow-on studies that are more controlled to look at uh, causation between usage of different APIs and languages and security outcomes. So in conclusion, we set out to create a security contest in which contestants both build and break software. We did it at scale on the internet. Um, and we have uh, used and continue to use the data generated by the contest as an experiment to measure the relationship between software development and security. Check us out on the internet and think about participating in the next one we run. Please. Um, I'm curious if you had any repeat participants between the two different iterations of the contest. And if so, did you see if many of them improved or continued to score about the same? Did they repeat their mistakes? I do not know. Um, but that's an interesting question. Thank you. Um, Eric Bodden, Paderborn University. Um, great work. Um, so I was wondering in the, um, um, in the second phase, so where you have the attacks running, um, the bracket phase, so were, you, were the participants given any sort of source code or was it? Yes, like they were distributed the source code for all implementations during the, for everything that everyone made, yes. Okay, thanks. Oh. Hi, um, Matt Wright, Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, do you have any notions about um, measuring whether people uh, learned from the contest? Um, so there, there is a, you, you could, at the moment we have like a sort of informal measure because people say, ah, I participated in this, I thought I knew what was going on during the build it phase, but then all these bugs were found and that was very educational um, because someone showed me how everything I did was wrong. Um, but I don't think we did do anything to- Did you take surveys or something? Yes, yes, there are surveys at the end of this, yes. Okay. People also just email us. If you do things on the internet, people will be very liberal with simply emailing you and telling you exactly how they feel about everything that's going on in their <laughs> lives. Hi, uh, Chris Tyson from North Carolina State. I was curious if you guys had thought at all about how this might be implemented in a traditional classroom setting, so in an undergraduate or graduate level security class, and how that might change compared to the MOOC. Yeah, um, we have, and we're sort of exploring making this like a part of existing courseware um, at UMD and other universities. Um, I don't know how it would really, I'm not, I, don't, I don't have a good sense for how it would be different. Um, I kind of think that Based on like the, the, the MOOC participants do have a broad range of experience. So there are some people that have been writing software for like two decades. Um, and I don't think you'd find that in a classroom. Um, so I'd sort of posit that they would do like a little worse, but I don't have any, I can't, I don't, I don't think I have the, the data to like conclusively stand behind that, but that's my sense. All right, thanks. Hi, uh, Ed Schwartz from CMU. Did you see any obfuscation on the part of the builders, either by just trying to make their program like really difficult to read, um, or by choosing really obscure programming languages? Well, there was a team that used Haskell, um, <laughs> but I don't think they intended to make that obfuscatory. We did call out in the rules that you can't intentionally obfuscate your program, and we said that we would DQ you if you did. Um, and we, we, we think that mostly worked. Um, but no, so, so not really. I think I'm, I'm kind of wondering exactly what the motivation behind the person writing some, a command line program in PHP was. <laughs> Um, if, it was, if it was part of that or they just knew that language, I'd sort of buy either. Um, but, but no one chose an in, like a, a sort of intentionally obfuscatory language, um, like BF or something. <laughs> okay, thanks. Hello there, nice work. Um, I'm Markov Kolweis from Microsoft Research. So I was wondering um, whether you thought about repeating kind of this break it, fix it uh, uh, cycle and what, uh, where there's still kind of could you still break it after they fixed it, actually? Yeah, yeah, so we've given some thought to like having an iterated round between, or like having, having the, 
the entire contest basically be continued iterations of I make some software, I put it on the internet, someone breaks it, it goes down, I fix it, I put it back up, someone breaks it, it goes down. Um, Sometimes, like, like this, this is a sort of contest design space of like how much endurance do your contestants have and what can you reasonably expect them to, to do. And right now we do this over like four or five weeks, which I think is sort of the limit of what you can expect people on the internet to do for you for a shot at prize money. Um, so, yeah, we've, we've thought about that. We're trying to figure out ways to, to change the contest structure to accommodate that. I'm pretty interested in that because I think it mirrors more directly the, like this is, this is sort of like one shot at what happens in the real world and this continued cycle thing mirrors it more directly. Great, well let's thank our speaker. <laughs> and thank you all for coming to this session. Please enjoy the coffee and whatever else is out there. <laughs>